This is the story of an extraordinary doctor, Sejal who would later be praised throughout the country as the man with a thousand hands and a healer of all kinds of diseases. One day, shortly before Sejal turned 15, he lost his title in his home because his father disinherited him and expelled him from the dukedom of Ardek and announced his eldest son, Monoglock, as the next heir. Sejal's stepbrother laughed at him after becoming the heir. He said he won't leave this dukedom like someone like Sejal. Sejal is the heir to a ducal lineage, has worked hard and studied hard every day, but when his mother left the world, and his stepmother took the seat of the legal wife, his position in the family changed drastically. With his stepmother who wants to make Monoglock the heir, and with Monoglock who has a domineering personality. Sometimes, Sejal was cut with a sword, and sometimes he was pushed down. He has been tortured by them without the fear of being seen. His father pretended not to see it and the decisive moment came when the blessing ceremony at the age of 13. In that ceremony, Monolov acquired the skills of blessing the sword god and emperor's sword which are considered one of the best skills one can acquire. If a nobleman had that skill, he would be ridiculed. In contrast, he was given the blessing of the goddess Amelia. It is what's commonly referred to as a bad skill. Even the priest had the who is that look on their face during the ceremony. Moreover, the goddess Amelia is a relatively unknown god. After the skills were given, his father said, they couldn't have any more lifestyle magic holders in this duchess's house. He ordered Sejal to leave the house in the morning and was not allowed to call himself Earl Deck. After this, Sejal can't show his face to his stepmother and Monoblock. He goes back to his quarter thinking about all this for Valms, the dark elf is waiting for him. She is Sejal's personal maid. As he enters, Velms asks Sejal if the talking is done. He realizes that she heard everything. She comments that he has a big smile on his face. This is because he is happy. She says that he has been disinherited and banished, but he is strange because he is happy after this. She is sure that Ladyship would be saddened. He questions if she already heard everything. Valms followed Sejal's mother and came into this house. Now that his mother is no more, and he is the only son, he is going to have to leave this house too and Val would inevitably follow him. Sigil says that his father ordered him to leave the house tomorrow morning. He says that it is better to leave as soon as possible. That's why he is thinking about leaving now. Val says that she will be with him and has already packed the luggage. With that, they decide to leave the house and reports Sigil's grandfather. His grandparents from the mother's side live in the barony of Digo, which is located a little far from the royal capital. It is a big city with a strong castle and a wall. The roads are very bad and it is a bit bumpy journey. During their journey, Sejal decides to look at the S status of his skill. The god who blessed him, Amelia, is the goddess of creation. Goddess of creation refers to the creator goddess who is said to have created this world. Her name, Amelia, is not generally known. But the creator of goddess is the highest of the gods. Sejal thinks that the king would have surely confirmed him as the next duke. If his stepmother knew, she would scream. If the word got out that he had the creator's blessing, it is fortunate that his status was not confirmed by the dukes. This means that he has the blessing of the Most High and when the stepmother knows about this, she will surely come after him to make him leave the world and make Monoglock a duke. He thinks that they need to build up their strength in case they find out about the blessing. Even if he keeps his distance, he can't let his guard down. He is in the middle of his thoughts when Valm says that they are going into Baron Digo's territory. He looks out to see the border and thinks it wouldn't be easy for even the royal army to take down this place. He has no desire to be a nobleman. Maybe it is because he has memories of two previous lives. In his two previous lives, he was a sage. At that time, he used to be called the Great Sage. When his memories revived in this life, he thought about it. The answer was very simple. What he couldn't accomplish in his previous life was that he wanted to see the end of the world and travel. There's a lot in this world that he didn't know about. But going on journeys or defending himself, he is not strong enough for it. As Velms and Sejal reach their destination, they are greeted by Roxwell, who has been expecting them for some time now. They go inside the house when Sejal's grandfather, Baron Indias Digo, is waiting for them. Baron looks at Sejal and rushes towards him to meet him, but Velms stops him. Sejal explains that he has been expelled from the dukedom. Baron says that he doesn't care about that. He asks Velms to accept him for a moment and let him meet Sejal, but she doesn't listen. 
Baron is the head of the kingdom's largest trading company, Barodego Merchant, which is known to be the biggest trading house in the kingdom. Sejal tries to talk to his grandfather while Velms keeps them away. Baron wants to get in touch with his sweet grandson. They are in the midst of their conversation when the grandma arrives with some food. She says to Sejal that his grandfather has been waiting for him for a long time. She requests him to give some more company to Baron. Sejal agrees to do so because if that is what his grandma wants then he has no choice. As they settle down and have some food, grandma asks what he is going to do now after Sejal explains everything that has happened so far. He says first of all, he is thinking of gaining strength by working as an adventurer and a healer in the royal capital. Grandfather says he knows what an adventurer is but he questions about the healer. Sejal says that it is the perfect place for training in magic. His skill set is lifestyle magic creation. It is completely different from the commonly known lifestyle magic. He can also use it for defense but magic that helps people is more effective. It is a trait that makes it easier to gain proficiency. Sejal can magically use everything he needs to survive and operate. It is a versatile skill that allows him to use the best magic in the world at his disposal, tailored to his needs. He says that when he gets strong he wants to travel the world. Baron says that traveling is suited for boys. He gets angry stating that if Sejal goes, Velns will also leave. He says he won't forgive that. But Grandma stops him stating that Sejal can do whatever he wants to do, and the same goes for Velms. Velms has always been bitter with everyone, but she has always been so kind to Grandmother. Sejal thinks that it might be because his her generosity. Later, they visit the royal capital to talk to Johnson, owner of Johnson's shop, and a subsidiary of the Borodigo Trading Company. Hmm. Sejal asks about a detached house with cheap rent as he is looking for a place as close as possible to the common and the favela. Johnson thinks about it a little, then says that he thinks there is a place that is right on the border between the common and the favela. But there is a small problem with that place. He says that it is kind of a mishap but it is more troublesome than it seems. Just then, Velns comes in stating that the place is Manager's family mansion. Her tone is so creepy that it startles Sejal. Johnson and Sejal say that they thought their heart would stop. She argues that she was here the whole time but she was silent. Velms and Johnson argue on this for a while Sejal tries to relax and have some tea. Johnson and Velms have known each other for quite some time. According to them, they argue at the touch of a button, but they are good friends. Both were like this a long time ago. Well, Velms is a dark elf, so she's always looked the same since Sejal was little. But in fact, she is a few hundred years old. He is thinking about all this when Velms notices this and asks what he is thinking about. He gets nervous and lies he wasn't thinking about something like that. Maybe he shouldn't be thinking about her age at all or it might get bad. Johnson says the property is definitely the house of the Manichesins, as Velms claimed. The many chasers were tortured there and forced to lead the world behind them about 20 years ago. But the thing is, they still appear. Sejal questions about Marichisser's appearance asking if they will appear in the form of a spirit. Johnson agrees stating they do appear as spirits. Sejal questions Johnson if he owns the house. Johnson disagrees saying it belonged to a merchant of his acquaintance. He says because of the spirits, the property has remained unsold for a long time. <laughs> Sejal says that he can cleanse the evil spirits from the house. Johnson says if he is the Sejal who has received the blessings of the goddess of creation, it might be possible. As a grandfather's right hand, Johnson who oversees several businesses in this royal capital is one of the few people who knows about Sejal's blessing. Velms comments about the cleansing saying it seems interesting. Sejal finds it a little dark and asks her not to say like that as it makes him shiver. She laughs stating she can warm him if he wants. Yeah. Sejal gets annoyed asking her to stop it. He asks her not to do such things in front of people. After that, they visit the property Johnson discussed about. The appearance of the property almost seems new and the surrounding area is also clean. It looks grander than most aristocratic estates. The real estate agent comes with them to the property introducing it as the Manichus's mansion. Sejal questions if five small silver coins a month are enough for a mansion like this. A house of that size should cost no more than three large gold coins. However, there's also a reason for such low rent of the mansion. There's a hint of ill omen emanating from the villa. It is like a bad influence that made the neighborhood uninhabitable. The abandoned houses have been torn down and replaced by large vacant lots. Sejal asks the agent what's inside the villa. 
The agent replies saying that he has no idea what lies inside. Sejal looks at him with a questionable expression on his face. The agent gets nervous saying he has no idea what's going on in there. He is afraid Sejal will have to guess. With that, Sejal decides to go inside the villa. As he opens the main gate and steps inside the grounds of the villa, Valms and Sejal experience a strong pressure in the wind. It seems that there is a powerful evil spirit that lies ahead of them inside the house. As far as Sejal knows, Valms is skilled enough to become the best in this world to compete first or second in the world. He finds it interesting to see that an evil spirit can make Valms look so powerful. He decides to use the lifestyle magic creation. He uses his spell, Enemy Search. This is a detection spell that will show allies in blue, civilians in white, and hostiles in red on the map. He looks around and observes the map to realize that there are seven red ones in the house, these are evil spirits. Sejal asks the agent if he would raise the rent after the evil spirits are lifted from the house. The agent says that in that case, he would show him a new house at a very reasonable price. After listening to that, Sejal asks Velms to let them go home. The agents stop them and beg them to exterminate the evil spirits. The villa has a huge empty space. It is like they want them to develop it. Once the evil spirits are exercised, the land will be worth a fortune. There is no doubt that the house will sell for a considerable amount of money. Sigil says that he will rent the place for five small silver coins no matter what. Left with no choice, the agent agrees. Sigil says that if he manages to get rid of the evil spirits, he would like to receive five large gold coins as a reward. After all, the surrounding also belongs to the Sanders shop. He says that if the place is developed, the profit won't be less than a thousand large gold coins. The agent agrees to give five gold coins to Sejal once the evil spirits are lifted. After that, Valms and Sejal enter the house. The interior of the house is as good as a duchess's. Before they could do anything else, the evil spirits came at them. They want them to be vanished from the world. Valms asks Sejal to step back and tries to beat the spirits. However, there are too many feasts for one's eyes. She questions if Sejal has any plans. He says it's not something as fancy as a plan, but he asks her to wait and watch. He uses the Holy Barrier Area spell to protect himself and Valms against the evil spirits. Even before receiving the blessing, he was able to use some magic with the knowledge of his past life. As expected, he wasn't able to handle something like this up to this point. But now, he can freely control even such great magic. He shrinks the evil spirits altogether in front of him. Sejal is surprised that the evil spirits haven't run off into the city by now. Maybe they are stuck in this house, he wonders. So, turns out the evil spirits were monsters. There were six high ghosts and a lich. The lich is an evolved form of the high ghost, and it is a very powerful monster. It is understandable that a half-hearted priest would be defeated. Sejal talks to the spirits saying he understands how they feel. But maybe they should just give up and go to heaven now. He questions if they even know who tortured them like this in the first place. He questions if they know where the culprit is right now. He says that there is nothing they can do now. He is having a full-fledged conversation with the evil spirits, while Velm stands there surprised to see him having a real conversation with the evil spirits for a while. She thinks they might be communicating through their barrier. Expecting Sejal, she is sure, he is the only person in the whole world who can communicate with a lich. She wonders if she should be happy about it. Sejal can understand the sorrows of the Lich as he was tortured by his stepmother and stepbrother. He explains to Valms that Lich and his family want revenge on the people who tortured them and forced them to leave the world. But it seems they don't know where they are or if they are even here now. He says that the Lich wants him to find the culprit so that he can be subjugated to him. It is an incident from 20 years ago. It is more likely that he won't ever find them. He questions if this is still good with the Lich. He says that the faces can still change when the Lich claims he remembers their faces. Finding a culprit with just this kind of information is incredible. Valm <sighs> says they can't keep searching for revenge forever. If he is saying that he would be fine even if the culprit is not found, she suggests taming them and getting on with it. Even if he purifies them like this, they won't be able to go to heaven. So she thinks it is better to leave some chances open to them. Sejal looks at Valm's already knowing her intention for the gold coins they would get if he gets the Lich. However, after thinking about it, he decides to tame the Lich. He uses his spell of taming and tames the Lich, clearing the villa from the bad omen caused by them. After that, they live in that villa. 
The lich guy, Solderic, who built the house regained the form of their human self because Sejal tamed them. It allowed them to evolve into a tribe called the Lich Spirit. Solderic was originally a merchant. Twenty years ago, a rebellion of servants vanished his entire family. He remembers the names and faces of his servants, but Sejal doesn't know if their traits are still the same today. Solderic is now working as Sejal's servant. As Solderic seats Sejal for breakfast, a cute little girl, named Artemis, comes with forks. Solderic asks her to put the cutlery in the order in which Sejal uses it. Artemis apologizes to Sejal as she can't put the cutlery in the order he likes. She was a high ghost who evolved into a tribe called the Lichdal. The servants who tortured this child 20 years ago were brutes. Sejal wondered no matter how much grudge the servants held against Solderic, they didn't have to torture a child. He assures her that she will learn it with time. Sejal was going to take Lich only but they seemed to be one heart, so he tames them all together. The other high ghosts also evolved into liches even though they couldn't take human form. And, above all, by being tames, they were able to move around freely. He also cleans the house. Sander said he had bought up the whole area while it was still cheap. Because right now, the other landowners don't know that he tames the evil spirits. Sejal is having breakfast when Solderic asks if he has some plans for today. Sejal agrees to have plans for the day. Sejal threw away the Sejal name. Now he is just Sai. After breakfast, he gives the house's responsibility to Solderic and is about to leave the house when Valms asks him if he is going outside. Sejal suggests opening a clinic. This marks the new beginning for Sai. He obtained a base and an unexpected force. While <sighs> Valm sits there looking up at the ceiling trying to overcome her boredom. Sai visits Johnson to talk about his visit to the Adventurer's Guild to register, but when he tries to accept, they treated him like a beginner and they wouldn't let him take it. He questioned if they were too cruel towards him. Johnson looks at him with a smile and questions if he is going to gossip today. Sai says he is here to talk about the money. This interests Johnson and he wants to know more now. Sai takes out the box in which the Red Dragon lies. He says he would like to lead the responsibility of selling the Red Dragon to him. Johnson is surprised oh. by seeing the Red Dragon as it is rare. He gets more excited once he looks at the dragon and finds out that the dragon is intact. He says he got it and asks Sai to leave it to him as he will take good care of him. Johnson says that for the time being, the price is set at 1,500 large gold coins. After deducting 40% for brokerage fees and taxes, he says to Sai that his income is expected to be 60%, that is 900 large gold coins. Sai says he would like to take 50%. He asked Johnson to sell six more of the Red Dragon in contrast for him. Sai got the near the summit of Baldot Volcano one day ago. It is a well-known fact that the Baldodo Volcano is home to a huge herd of Red Dragons. The Red Dragon is said to be the most powerful species of dragon, capable of destroying small nations in an instant. Not many people would dare to compete with the Red Dragons. That is why Mount Balda has become a Red Dragon paradise. As expected the title of the strong is not a flaunt for these dragons. Sai competed with the dragons alone, but it was exhausting as the red dragons are very strong. So he used Summon Lich for help. He asked the Lich to beat the dragon without harming them. He then used the Life Drain spell to steal the dragon's life strength. With that he was able to take the dragon after some effort. The red dragon is one step above Lich, but as expected from the team of five, they were easily able to come over the dragon. He then used his strain magic to capture the dragon. Lastly, Sai used the magic of storage to store the dragon in the box. After that, Valms came back and asked about the dragon. Sai told her that he defeated the dragon. She was happy to see that Sai was able to win alone. She said that he was her hero. No matter how many dragons come, she believes that he can't be defeated. He thanked her for her kind words even though he thinks Valms is more like a hero. Just then they encountered more dragons coming towards them at once. Valms got angry as she was interrupted by the dragons while she was talking to Sai. She decided to punish them and easily captured the remaining dragons. Like that, Sai hunted seven red dragons. As he goes back home, he is welcomed by Valms. She was very bored while being alone. He knows that the clinic is a cheap place but no one goes there. He thinks he will have to think of some way to make it better known. He has been running this clinic for a while now and still, he has no customers. While he is worrying about the clinic, Valm says that they should love as she is bored. He is about to say something when a patient barges inside the clinic, disappointing the two. 
The patient asked if the prices in the sign outside were true. Valms quickly goes back to the reception desk and tells the patient that for the fourth class, five large copper coins are required. If he is a third-class citizen, they can treat him for two small silver coins. She asks the patient to show the ID first. The patient becomes very happy as the price is very cheap. If someone asks a priest, he will charge them 50 times more than this. At worst, he will charge about 500 times more than Say's price. Sai smiles in peace as he finally gets a patient. The patient shows his ID stating that he is a third-class citizen. Valms asks him if he is an adventurer. Say and Valms look at his injuries only to be shocked by his situation. He has bandages all over his body. The injury stinks and there is poison. There's some necrosis too. Sai asks the patient if he got hit by a monster. The patient agrees saying that it was a fang viper which is a snake-like monster with a powerful corrosive venom. Sai says that if they leave him like this, he will vanish eventually. The patient asks if he can't be healed. He questions if he wants more money. Sai asks him not to think like that as he is not going to charge extra for this treatment. He asks the patient to sit tight and performs the analysis magic on him. With that, Sai opens a clinic and begins to treat and heal people. A new patient named Dawson comes in with 12 affected areas. Three of them are broken or minor, surface necrosis in five locations and rotten bones in the remaining four locations. He treats the patient by first removing the detoxification and cleansing. Sai uses his regeneration spell to do that. Once he is done with treatment, the patient is now easily able to move. Sai suggests not competing recklessly again. The patient is relieved as Sai saved him. He is very happy and leaves the clinic saying that if something ever happens again, he will count on Sai. Dawson thanks Sai one more time and leaves. Valms was a little depressed as they had only one patient that day. The next day, Sai goes to visit Johnson after hearing he has got a new red dragon to sell. Johnson's shop had Vale thanks Sai for coming all the way. He offers Sai some muffins that is made made with his wife and daughter. Sai has heard that Vale is in the process of negotiating with the Red Dragon to give it a more prominent position in the marketplace. It seems that Johnson will be splitting the goodwill with Vale soon. The two go inside to have a cup of tea where Vale says that the Red Dragon will be sold to the Duke of Delaria. Sai thinks about the Duca of Delaria, who is one of the ministers. It seems to be a big shot. Vale says that the sale price has been set at 2,000 large gold pieces. Sai comments, saying that the price is quite a jump. Vale explains that since they have received offers from several families, so they have put them out to bid. Johnson says he has been in the business for a long time, but this is the first time he has dealt with an intact red dragon. He supposes that the price is due to the dragon being so rare. He secretly tells Say that the Adventurer's Guild has asked for a supplier right on schedule. Sai asks if they would like to give him the name. Johnson doesn't mind it, saying that the name will be exposed eventually. He gives the box to Say, stating he will be paid on the next dark day of the week. After that, he goes outside happily wondering where he should go now. As he comes across his clinic, he is stunned to see a rush of people in front of it. People want to go inside and get the treatment. Everyone is waiting for their turn to enter the house and visit it. He sits down on the side when an old lady approaches him questioning about the termination of the ghosts. Sai explains that he managed to terminate them somehow. The old lady is impressed by him for being so powerful at such a young age. She says he is not only good at recovery magic, but he is also a top-notch demon exorcist. She decides to leave after this when Sai suggests she not push herself after her knees heal. <sighs> he stands there stunned questioning what is going on all of a sudden. Vamel standing there as a receptionist says that she is sure the guy who came yesterday must have blown a whistle. She sits down asking the patient 28 to go inside. Sai also goes inside the room to treat people for the day. As he treats a child for his bones, he bids her bye and suggests she not break any bones again. The child <gasps> is about to leave when Sai notices Valms looking out worriedly. He asks her if something happened. She smiles at him saying that it's just bugs outside. He questions about the trash bugs. He also asks if he can get the next person in. After treating all the patients for the day, Sai is exhausted. Valm says she will lock up the door and have dinner now when some guys come in. Valm looks <sighs> at them and realizes that they are here again. Sai also realizes that these guys were what Valm's called trash bugs at the time. He thinks he has seen them before. 
But before Sai could say anything, the lead guy asked Sai angrily if he was Sai. Valms gets angry and stands in front of them, saying that they didn't call Sai with honor. Sai comforts Valms to calm her. Valms asks the guys who they are and what they want from him. She also asks them to watch their language while speaking to him. The lead guy introduces himself as German, head of security. He says, he is from the Adventure Guild. He says, since Sai has been suspected of violating the guild rules, he wants Sai to accompany him from now on. He decides to go with German and lets Solderich know about it. Solderich is sad but didn't say much. He asks Valms to go with him. German says she can't go and Sai says that Valms and him are one and the same. If she is not with him, he is not going. The guys with Derman are terrified by Valms. However, Dermis agrees to take Valms too. With that, they reach the Adventurers Guild Royal City branch at the Kingdom of Eldoret. They are welcomed by the guild master of this branch. Sai introduces himself and Valms and asks what he can do for them. The head of the guild looks at Valms with a questionable expression on her face as both of them are elves. A girl named Rosie comes close to them saying she is the head of the purchasing department. She says that they have determined that he has violated the guild constitution. Sai questions about the violated constitution. Rosie says for the adventurers who belong to the adventurers guild, it is mandatory to prioritize bringing back the monster materials to the guild. She asks if he knows about that. Sai says that he knew about it. He read the rules when he signed up for the guild the other day. Rosie questions the red dragon he brought to Johnson's shop, does he understand that it is something that should have been primarily brought to the guild? Sai says that he understands very well that he should have brought the red dragon to the guild. The head of the guild says that it is against the rules. She says she knew they were knowingly trafficking. She adds he needs to be punished. She orders Rosie to hand over Sai to the quest client. Rosie stops Theron, saying they shouldn't do that. Valms gets angry due to which the pressure in the wind rises. Sai tries to calm her down but Valms says she will beat them all. Sai says that this is also forbidden and he needs her to lay low for a while. She is not convinced. However, she calms down as Sai insists. Sai tries to explain that regarding selling the red dragon to the shop, he doesn't think he is breaking any rules. The head of the guild asks for the reason behind his action. She thinks that Sai quickly noticed Valm's intent and stopped the head of the purchasing department. She is still trying to keep her cool. She thinks that Sai seems like a superior being. Sai says that because he knows the guild rules, before taking it to Johnson's shop, he tried to attain the Red Dragon's quest, but she refused to assign me the quest so he sold it. He asks the head guilty not to accuse him of violating the rules. Rosie gets angry at Sai and says he is spouting nonsense. Darum calms Rosie asking her to leave the matter to her and be quiet for a minute. The head of the guild says she wants to confirm if he remembers the name of the receptionist. Sai says that he never got her name but she was a curly-haired blonde girl. The guild's head realizes who Sai is talking about and orders German to bring Armida. Sai wonders if his name will come out alongside Armida. All the staff knows what's going on here but they don't know what's going in in the guild. He wonders if there are a lot of people in the guild. He thinks that knowing the happenings within the guild is the job of the guild master. After some time, Darman brings Armida who was hiding in the warehouse. The guild's head questions if Armida was the receptionist to which Sai agrees. The head guild then questions Armida about Sai and asks if she was the one who registered him as an adventurer. Armida agrees. The head guild then questions if she refuses to assign a quest to Sai. Armida disagrees, stating that this is not true. The headmaster says that Sai says the opposite. Rosie interferes in the conversation, saying that Armida isn't the type to lie and says she must have faith in her. The headmaster says to Rosie that she should be careful with her judgment. If she leans too much on one side, she will misjudge the truth. Rosie questions the guild's head if she cares more about her subordinates or the outsiders. Just then, Vales claps and brings out a diamond-like object, stating that this will do things nicely while everyone stares at her. Sai smiles at her saying that he has an adventurer's registration card. He got it as a souvenir from his registration as an adventurer. Valms uses that diamond to see the pass where Sai goes to the reception to be registered as an adventurer. Armelia asks for his full name in the view. She looks at the form he fills and says that the rest of the fields are right. She asks him to read the detailed rules and regulations in the guild book in the waiting area. Sai says he already read them while he was waiting. 
Almina says if he has any questions, he can ask any of the guild members. Then, she gives Say the registration card and says that he will need three large silver coins to have it reissued and suggests he not lose it. Say then says that it is a fast request but he would like to take up this quest that was posted. She takes the form to check it. She reads the paper and then says that this is the quest to gather material for Taxidermy Red Dragon. She says no matter how much he wants to do it, that is a lot of work for someone who just signed up. Sai tells her that this is not a problem but Almeida says that there is a problem. <gasps> Almeida says that the quest's deadline is 10 days after receiving the order. If he doesn't bring the Red Dragon within 10 days, he will be fined one-tenth of the rewards amount, he will be fined a hundred large gold coins. Sai tries to explain that as an adventurer, he is free to take any quest that he wants. However, Almeida denies saying that every year, there's a newcomer who thinks they can defeat a dragon. Sai looks at her and questions if she is saying that he is not allowed to take on this quest. Almeida agrees saying he can't take it up. Sai says that since it can't be helped, he will have to give it up. Almeida agrees and asks him to take any other quests of lower difficulty that he would like to take on. After listening to this, everyone in the room is shocked. The guild's head orders Durman to take Almeida into custody. Before Durman can do anything, Rosie interrupts saying she was the one who gave the instructions. She says she was the one who told Almeida to hide in the warehouse and lie. She prevented an amateur from going on a foolhardy quest and vanish. She says that this girl's judgment was never wrong. The guild's head questions how many reckless adventurers have been saved by the judgment of this receptionist. This request just happens to be from some renowned nobleman. Rosie says that if only he hadn't demanded the guild take responsibility, nothing would have happened. The guild's master stands up and apologizes to say for involving him in a matter that is not directly related to him. She says that it is hard to tell if they were completely in the wrong. Hereafter, they will carefully investigate and take disciplinary actions. Sai says that it is the middle of the night and he is tired of being called here. He says he went through a lot of trouble. He leaves after saying he hopes that the guild master will be able to do what she said she would. They leave the adventurer guild and go back home. Sai is relieved that he is finally going to eat something. Valm's questions Sai if he is satisfied with this. He agrees saying he feels bad for the receptionist whom he got involved with but he was able to get an apology from the guild, which was his purpose. Now all they need is a good negotiation position. After three days, it is decided that Rosie and Armida will have three unpaid months and they will be on probation for six months. The other 24 who remained silent will receive a three-month salary cut. Danon will have one unpaid month and the guild master will have three unpaid months. The head of the adventurer is discussing the decision when she feels unwell. She apologizes, stating she hasn't slept much. She says that for causing Sai great trouble, she would like to compensate him by paying a hundred large gold coins. She questions if that is okay with him. Sai thinks that it is exceptional to have a hundred large gold coins for a false accusation. He guesses they are trying their best to maintain peace, especially with the guy who has the ability to beat the red dragon. He guesses that it helped that he was in a bad mood. It made things easier to negotiate afterward. He thinks about having the money when the guild's head says if he is not satisfied with the amount then they can raise it to 150. She says she is afraid she can't go any higher than that. Sai says that if she could do him a favor, he would not need those gold coins. He adds that he would even be willing to reduce the staff's punishment. The guild's head has a bad feeling about this but she agrees. Sai says he just wants some information. He questions if she knows about the Manich's mansion. She agrees stating that there is a rumor going around the royal capital that he has purified the evil spirits. She questions if he knew they were members of the Manich's family. He says he didn't know that but he thought it would be the Manich's spirits since they were in the mansion. He says that the Manich's wanted to take revenge on those who forced them to leave the world and tortured them. The guild's head apologizes saying she doesn't think she can be of any help. She only came to the royal capital after the incident. She wonders if there is anyone in the guild who knows what happened 20 years ago. Besides, she has looked through the documents, and she believes there have been several arrests regarding that case. She says there were money laundering crimes committed by those in the slums, and stolen items should have been found as well. The torturers were not paupers. Sai asks her to think about it carefully. Why is it that only the Miniches were tortured and forced to leave the world? The guild head says given the scale of the mansion, it is only natural that they were servants staying overnight, 
and not a single servant vanished. Sai says he is not asking her to find the culprit. He is asking her to find him the servants who were there at the time of the incident. He just needs to know where they were and what they are doing now. Once he knows where the servants are, he will ask them what happened to them. He says that if she is not able to find them, he won't complain either. The head of the guild thinks a little, then says that if he insists she will do it. As they are about to leave, the guild head says that the rumors about his success in slaying the red dragon will eventually spread throughout the kingdom. The king may invite him. She says that if the king invites him, let the guild know about it. She thanks him for the hard work. As they go back to their home, Velm says that her hair is more drier than his. She says maybe it is due to the recent rain or maybe it is just a little damaged. Sai asks her to stop reading his mind. He thinks that as intended, he managed to get the guild to cooperate. If they could find a few of the servants, he is sure they would be able to relieve Solderic and the rest from their grudge. The guild's head looks at Vamels from the window remembering her as the demon fighter. The adventurer's guild head, Hermanius remembers the unforgettable tragedy of her childhood. From the dawn of the time, elves have been the guardians of the noble forests. However, they look down upon their subspecies, the dark elves. Then 200 years ago, the dark elves rebelled against the supposedly superior elves and an opposition between the two species began. At first, the elves seemed to hold the clear but at some point throughout the opposition, the tables would turn. The chieftain of the dark elves was replaced. The new chieftain was a woman with beautiful black hair. Black-haired elves are extremely rare. But if their eyes are also black, they are even rarer. A dark elf with such a rare appearance manipulated the darkness to drive the elves into a corner. While stomping on the head of a surrendering elf chieftain, she was laughing brazenly. Hermanius was so frightened by that smile that she couldn't do anything but tremble in her mother's embrace. Calamity Valms is the name that was itched into their elven souls. All the chiefs of the elves' race were executed, and only one child was spared. That was her, Hermanius. After losing her family and her family name, she left the forest and became an adventurer. Hermanius wonders why is Valms here. She has heard that the position of chief was finally handed over after about ten years. She wonders if she is destined to encounter the Calamity Valms. Hermanius shook off the thought saying she doesn't want such a fate. She doesn't want to be involved in this again. She wonders if she should quit her job as the <sighs> guild master. She has yet to even reach 230 years of age. She is worried as she doesn't want to vanish at such a young age. On the other hand, at the Duchy of Erratic Say's father is shocked to know that Delaria presented the red dragon to the king. He yells at Venice, the Count of Erratic and the head of the Erratic's branch family. He says he had thought he had asked him to handle this matter. He questions what is the meaning of this Venice. Venice says that it is true that he is responsible for being unable to procure the Red Dragon from the Adventurer's Guild. As for the man who hunted the dragon in question, it seems that he doesn't know who slayed it. He says that the man who defeated the Red Dragon was Sai whom he banished without their permission. The dragon was sold to the Johnson Trading Company, a subsidiary of the Baradego Trading Company. Say's father is shocked to hear that. Venice asks the Duke if he knows about the current state of the finances in their Duchy of Arcade. The Duke doesn't know anything in questions about it. Venice explains that here in the Kingdom of Alderet, there are two types of nobility. The feudal nobility, who own land, and the aristocratic nobility who don't. All six ducal families are part of the aristocratic nobility. Their funding mainly comes from the aristocratic pensions distributed by the government. Venice says that among all the dukedoms of their family, the Dukes of Auretic are the most financially powerful. It is all because of the support of the Borodego Company. He says that it was only because he had Sajol, the grandson of Baron Diego and the head of the Chamber of Commerce. The company was providing them with financial support as if it were candy. He is worried as since Sajol has been banished, they can't expect any further assistance from them. In fact, they may even be asked to repay the money they have borrowed. The Duke is shocked to hear about this and doesn't know what to say now. Venice realizes that the Duke didn't think about any of this. Seriously, this is a much bigger problem than the Red Dragon. He says that this will not only affect the Dukedom, but their branch family as well. He questions if they have the financial security to use their funds as they have in the past. He says that he will have to bring this matter up to the family council, which is a meeting where the main branch members of the Duke of Erratic discuss important matters. The Duke questions Venice if he is warning him about this. 
Vinna says that these are not just threats. He adds that in the first place, the revocation of Prince Sigil's right to succession is an important matter that should have been discussed with the family council. He thinks that the fact that the duke banished Sejal without a second thought was enough of a headache. Now, Sejal has even defeated the Red Dragon, and of all the people, he sold it to the Dukes of Deleria, who are enemies of Erratic. Venice leaves the room after saying he believes that Monoglock should defeat a monster on par with the Red Dragon. After that, he hopes that the Duke will be able to prepare a good plan to secure future funding before the House appraisal. He wishes he could have done it sooner, even if it was by pressure, he should have made Sejal the head of the family. On the <laughs> other hand, Sai and Valns decide to have a picnic where they have delicious sandwiches. Valns looks at the herbs nearby and asks about their purpose. She questions if he needs herbs for his recovery magic. Sai tells her that he is thinking about improving the soap. His current soap makes his skin feel tight after washing. He adds that she had also told him that the soap makes her hair dry. Sai is satisfied with his life at the moment as the view is great. The weather is nice, and food is delicious, and a beautiful woman is sitting next to him. What more could he ask for? After having some food, they decide to hunt more herbs. Sai tries to climb the mountains to find the right herb for the soap while Valns appraises him for his strength. He finds a new <gasps> herb called Rokai, which is a medicinal herb that moisturizes hair and skin. Valns is amazed by the existence of such a herb. She takes the herbs and excitedly decides to go back and plant them in the mansion. Like that, they made the field. While working in the field, Sai tells Bones that he mixed black soil and humus together. Now, he just needs to add a little magic to further elevate its growth. He uses the spell that bestows the grace of a holy power. It is just an extra piece of land on the property, so it's not that much. He hopes that it goes well so that Bones will be happy too. Just then, Artemis rushes towards them to ask them to have some tea. He thanks her for bringing the tea. Artemis's smile takes away all his fatigue. Valms interrupts him saying that Artemis is a lowly. Sai gets nervous and says he doesn't care if she is a lowly or not. He finds her adorable. Valms starts crying after hearing this. She says that he is favoring lollies. Sai calms her down and assures her that he is obsessed with her. Artemis goes to Valms asking what she is making. Valm smiles at Artemis, saying she is making something very good. She tells her that when she is done, they should take a bath. Sai looks at them smiling and wonders if it's bathing the dead spirits in need. He thinks that it sounds like fun. As the night falls and their work ends, Valm goes to take a bath while Sai enjoys yet another cup of tea. After some time, Valm rushes out excitedly saying her hair is glowing. She says her skin is moisturized too. She feels like a year younger. He looks at her and says her age is a hundred years old out loud. He quickly starts regretting mentioning her age as she jumps out and runs away. The next day, everyone is amazed by Vaughn's shiny hair and moisturized skin. A woman comes to her to give her some vegetables she grew at home. She looks at Vaughn's and is amazed by her beauty. She says Vaughn's looks even more beautiful today. Vaughn's last questioning if she noticed. The woman says she must have done something and asks about it. Valms replies, letting her know that she got a new soap. Sitting on the side of the room, Sai hears their conversation thinking it looks like Valms is having fun. He thinks that she is a girl too, so she can babble quite a bit. The woman asks if she can have some of the soap too. She says just a sample would be fine. Sai wonders what sample she is talking about. He hears Valms allowing her to have a sample of soap. This makes him question if they are planning on making more for distribution. He thinks he will focus on treatment for now. He is in the middle of his thoughts when a new patient comes in. He has dark hair and dark eyes. It is unusual, but he seems like Valm's relative. Sai thinks this is impossible since they are not from the same species. Sai looks at the guy's face wondering about the wound. He thinks it must have been caused by something sharp. He wonders if it was a sword. It looks like it is several years old. He asks the patient how he lost his eye and what did his parents do. However, the patient tells him that that is none of his business. Sai says he won't treat him unless he tells him everything he is asking. The patient gets angry stating that he has already paid. Sai says that if he doesn't tell him, he will return the money. The patient asks for his money back. So Sai asks Valms to return the patient's money. After that, the guy leaves in a hurry. 
Vons looks at him saying that the kid is getting carried away while Sight thinks he has a feeling that the guy will come back. After some time, Vons cries saying that they are out of soap. Sai says that this is because she gave it away to other people. She defends herself by saying that a woman's whole life is her hair and skin. An amazing soap deserves to be shared. He looks at her thinking that the beauty search never ends. Valm says that the medicinal herbs are growing nicely and suggests selling them. He says that he is a bit busy right now with his research, so he doesn't have any time to spend on making soap. Valm suggests hiring someone. She says that if he sells the soap, he will make a massive profit. With that, he decides to make the soap. He doesn't know if it will work like he thought after using the magic thought. He is happy to succeed in his work when he is informed by Solderic that a royal messenger has come to see him. He questions if he would like to meet him. He agrees and goes to see the royal messenger. The royal messenger apologizes for interrupting him as he knows he is busy. He says that he heard that Sai is the one who defeated the red dragon the one that was offered to his majesty a few days ago. He says that his majesty wishes to honor his achievement. He explains that he has come to inform him that his majesty wishes to present him with the medal of the great flame jewel, as well as a thousand gold coins. Sai is stunned to think about the medal of the great flame jewel. This is because out of the five different types of medals of honor, that's the second most prestigious one. The guildmaster said he may get invited to the palace, but receiving a medal is quite a new thing. He thinks that defeating a red dragon seems to be a bigger deal than he thought. The royal messenger questions if he would like to accept the request. Sai agrees and asks the royal messenger to inform his majesty that he accepts the invitation. He thinks that the medal could be useful in further torturing the duke. He wonders if he should show it to grandfather after he gets it. Just then, Solderic informs Sai secretly that there is yet another thing. Sai asks about Arthemis and questions where she is. Solderic informs him that she is in the warehouse behind the house. He goes inside the warehouse to find out that Arthemis has already confiscated the tools of the assassins. She points at the lead, stating he won't talk. Sai thinks even when she rubs salt into his wounds, he doesn't make a sound. He must have a strong will. He is surprised that even a cute little girl torturing men with such an innocent expression is quite amazing. He asks her to leave the rest to him and go help Solderic at the mansion. She agrees and runs outside leaving Sai with the assassins. Sai asks if the duke sends him. He guesses he won't tell him that easily. News of him defeating the red dragon and getting a medal of honor must have made him decide to hurry up and finally get rid of him. But this mansion is heavily guarded. An assassin would struggle to get in. Even if they manage to slip through Solderic's security, Vons is always by his side. He thinks that he should depend on others and become stronger. He uses his analysis magic to find out the information about the assassin. It turns out that his name is Sadbek Dreos Arminus Jules, and he is an assassin who belongs to the underground guild, the Crows of the Dark Knight. Sadbek says that after this appraisal magic, he only knows his name. Sai clarifies that this isn't appraisal magic. He says that Sadbek comes from the slums of a different empire. He had his first victim when he was 11 years old. Sadbeck and his older brother, Marsh, worked together until he was captured and executed. After escaping to this kingdom, he joined the Night Crows. He tells Sadbeck that he is the one who assassinated Count Bakshus. He laughs saying no one can get this kind of information with appraisal magic. Sadbeck is shocked by Sai's power and questions who he is. Sai says he is just a simple novice healer. He thanks Sadbeck for being extremely helpful as he was able to find out that the Crows of the Night have five bases in the royal capital. Now, he just has to go and find out who the client is himself. He says it would be troublesome if another assassination attempt was made. Sai questions if he should destroy them all while at it. He says if only Sadbeck has talked, he wouldn't have to go through all this trouble of burning his guild to the ground. Sadbeck says that they are not the type of guild to be destroyed so easily. Sai says that they should then at least help him in his research. With that, Valms and Sai are set to destroy the guild bases. He tells Valms that according to the analysis, one of the three guild leaders who organized his assassinations is called Bronbo. He looks at the map and says that it seems Branbo is nearby. Valms wonders how such a shady shady looking group of people can walk around here without getting reported. Sai explains that apparently the people in charge here are secretly tied to the Night Crows. He asks Velms to clear the back door. 
She says she knows that he will be fine but still asks him to be careful. She jumps down from the top of the building and takes the people from behind. After that, Sai also comes flying down but the guy notices him. Sai says that he guesses he is not as good at bombs as he was caught. As he steps foot on the ground, the guy marches forward to beat him. Sai swiftly dodges the blow and uses a stone called the Sage Stone to absorb the power. The Sage Stone is a type of philosopher's stone. Mages and alchemists have tried for years, but no one has even been able to create it. He competes with the guy while other people also come to the rescue of the guy. It seems like it is going to be a good competition. Say stone is so powerful that nothing can stand against it. He says that he needs the guy's vitality. He will leave enough to keep his breath for now, even though he will vanish soon. The sage stone is the key to immortality. By absorbing the vitality of others, it extends the lifespan of the owner and makes them basically immortal. It can also cure diseases and injuries. Such an item is highly sought after. If the world knew he made this stone, he would go down in history. Sai thinks that those guys' vitality should have extended his lifespan by roughly 10 years. Without those magic circles, he would lose control of the stone and then it would absorb his lifespan instead. He thinks that he must be extremely cautious when handling it. After that, Valens comes back questioning if she should take the second floor or the basement. She decides to go up so Sai has to go in the basement now. Just then, someone comes to blow at Sai. However, he escapes dead again. Sai tells him that he is being aimed by his guild. The guy says he doesn't know what he is talking about. He says he just tried to beat him and now he is playing dumb. The guy laughs saying he guesses that's the case. Sai says he might be a knight. Both compete with each other and Sai tries to use the sword but the guy is too swift and strong. So he uses his stone and absorbs the lifespan of the guy. He says he will regret becoming an assassin. He suppresses a difficult enemy and looks forward to what comes his way. After that, the head of the secret guild is waiting for Sai. Sai goes inside asking if this is the boss tomb of the Crow of the Dark Knight. He encounters three people, a guy, a small girl, and a bear-like creature. The guy welcomes Sai and the bear arches forward saying he won't let him beat his boss. Sai quickly uses the Holy Barrier Area spell and freezes the bear at the spot. The guy says that to think that a guild made up of highly skilled assassins, he had never expected it to be toyed by someone like Sai. Sai says that he should have thought about who he was going to lay hands on. The guy uses his powers to beat Sai, but he manages to escape as he is able to fly. The guy asks what he wants. He asks Sai's purpose. He calls himself the boss but Sai already knows his name is Jagas. He says the boss Brombo is not him but the maid over there. Jagas says if Sai thinks the little girl is the boss she is just a slave. He says she seems to have a very pleasant head on her shoulder. Sai says it doesn't matter who Barombo is as he is going to make everyone vanish. Just then, the little girl, Barombo clarifies that she is indeed Barombo. She asks Sai about his purpose. He says he wants information about the person who requested his assassination. She says that she will give him the information but she can't be forced to leave this world. She says that if she vanishes, many orphans whom she is raising will be left out in the cold. He says that it is useless to draw sympathy as she is raising these orphans to become like her. Gorombo requests him to let her go. He says that what she has been doing since a while ago is the exact opposite of that. Gorombo says it seems her charm is not working which makes Sai question her intentions. Gorombo says that unfortunately her divine protection is much stronger than his so she will punish the liars. She is about to use her spell, and Sai uses his stone but just then Jagas comes in the way asking her to stop. He thinks that it seems like Sai isn't charmed by her. As a result, Jagas' lifespan is absorbed by the stone making Barombo stand there in shock. After that, Sai says that she has a good subordinate Barombo. He says he will give Jagas a chance. He asks them to give up and give him the information or he will simply them all. He says he can also make them his subordinates. Barombo questions if he won't do anything to them if she becomes his subordinate. While Bear shouts standing at his place, telling Barombo that he can still defend them, Barombo gives in. She says she will obey as long as they can all survive. Sai warns her that if she betrays him, he will make her taste a greater pain than being vanished. He makes a contract with her with the help of his magic. Just then, Vons comes back when Sai informs her that Barombo and the others have joined as his subordinates. Vons is shocked to see another Loli. 
she questions why he runs after lollies when he has her. He clarifies that he isn't doing anything like that. Borombo, the big boss of the Dark Knight's Crows is a dwarf. She is considerably older than he is. Borombo provides the information about the client that Sai asks for. She says as he had instructed, the assassination squad has been terminated. From now on, they will work together with those who have come under their command to establish a new organization focused on intelligence gathering. She is providing him with the information while he thinks about not being interested in lollies repeatedly. He thinks that he has returned all the vitals of those who soared to obey him. He has let the children choose the path they want to pursue. They can be anything they want to be. He says that for those children who will help him in the field and soap making, he would like to teach them simple arithmetic and literacy. Borombo says that she has the right person for such a job. She says his name is Medius Aruba, who sued to be a knight of the royal order of a kingdom. Medius was dismissed from the knights after quarreling with a superior, a nobleman who had a bad relationship with him. Furthermore, his wife and daughter are not in this world anymore due to illness. When he lost his will to live, Barombo found him and picked him up. Barombo says that despite this face, Medius loves children. Perhaps he is seeing his own daughter's face in them. She thanks Sai once again for saving their lives and calls him Lord. Sai asks her not to call him Lord. He says that from now on, they are friends, she agrees and smiles at Sai. After that, they start working like normal when Valens notices that she is getting even colder today. Just then, Solderic comes in with Woods and questions if this is enough for the fireplace in the clinic. Valens is happy that it is winter and says her breath is white now. Even though, she doesn't breathe. As Valens goes inside, the guy from earlier is also there. Sai asks if he is ready to talk now. The guy says that his name is Pados. He doesn't know his father's face and his mother is probably drinking somewhere. He hasn't seen her in a while. He says that his eye has been popped off by some aristocrat's son. Sai decides to analyze Pados' health. He says it seems he can heal him. Pados gets happy after hearing this. Sai questions Pados about what he would like to do after his eyes are cured. Pados says that he wants to be an adventurer. Sai asks if he would like to work with him. Pados says he said he wants to be an adventurer. Sai questions how is he going to beat monsters with farmer skills. Pados asks how he knows his skill. Sai says that if he works for him, he will treat him. Pados gets angry saying that he is taking advantage of people's weaknesses and grabs Sai. Sai asks Pados to let go of him. He says he is not a match for him as he can't even defeat a demon. He says his skills aren't designed to defeat demons. He says he is a doctor himself and he wants every patient that comes into this clinic to live. He says he can't treat someone when he knows that they are going to leave the world in the field. Left with no choice, Pados gives in. He says he will work for Sai, but there is one condition. He says that he wants to give the person a hard blow who blinded him. Sai says he doesn't recommend that kind of thing. He questions if Pados can forget. Pados says that he can say that because he has lost an eye. Sai can understand the sentiment for being injured too unjustly. He had his back stabbed by his brother too. He questions if Pados has any idea where that person is. Pados says he doesn't know and questions if Sai can help find the person. He says he remembers his face very clearly. He says that the person is about his own age, he has red hair and he is fat. He also says that he has a mole under his eyes. He says he also has a bad look in his eyes. Sai thinks that this sounds familiar to him as the person seems to be monoglock. He heads down saying he is the same person who made him feel better too. This is such a stupid coincidence. Pados sits there shocked about the reality. Sai agrees to help Pados, but he asks him not to forget that after he has healed his eyes, he will be working for him. Pados says he keeps his promises. Sai thinks that if a commoner dared to rebel against a nobleman, he would not only be arrested but executed. Even though he has the urge to beat Monoglock, he has to think of a better plan. Even though Monoglock's actions won't take him anywhere. He is thinking about all this while Pados thinks it seems like a hundred years since he last saw him. He worked at the farm because of his great fertility god skill. He asks if he is supposed to take care of this plantation. Solderic sees him questioning what he is doing. He says he is Say's servant, so he needs to tone down his language. He says that starting today, Velms, and he will start teaching him and asks Pados to prepare himself. 
Solderick says that as long as Pados is Say's servant, he won't allow him to be dependent on his kindness. Sai looks at them through the window wondering no matter who Pados is, if he is being trained by Valms and Solderick, he will become a great servant. He wishes him to do his best. Just then, a guy comes in asking for Dr. Say for a house call. He requests him to spare a few minutes of his time. Valms questions about the house call. He thinks that the way he carries himself, he must be a servant of a fairly high-ranking aristocrat. She smells something fishy. Valms apologizes, saying they don't do house calls. The guy tries to argue when Sai comes out asking about the location. He tells Valms that since he came to the clinic, they must help him. Consultation hours are almost over anyways. The guy says that he would be obliged. He says he will take him to the skirts of the royal capital. He asks him not to speak about the patient to anyone as she is the daughter of Count Zolder Roselia. With that, they go to the Zolder, Count of Frontier's villa. He is known to be one of the most prominent military families in the kingdom of Ordred, a noble family that guards the border with the kingdom of Martis. Valms asks what is the condition of the lady. The servant tells them that she is severely ill and not very well according to the doctor. He says after grasping at straws, he went to see Dr. Sai. He asked her to take care of their young lady Rosalia. Sai assures him that he will do his best. As they enter in the room, Sai looks at Rosalia only to find out that she has earthy skin and her breathing is pretty slow. He thinks that even from a cursory glance, he can see she doesn't have long. He questions how long has she been like this. The servant says that it's been two days she collapsed suddenly and then got gradually worse. He says four days ago, she started looking like this. After this, Sai gets ready to start the diagnosis immediately. He says they don't even have a moment to lose. He uses his analytical skills to check her condition. The name of her illness is magic deficiency. Magic is the power that everyone, more or less, has. Similar to stamina, when magic is used and reduced, it should recover naturally. However, currently, she is under the influence of something abnormal, and the magic inside her is continuously being drained. He thinks about the reason for such a condition. He questions if there was anything unusual before she was ill. The servant says that she attended a tea party organized by Earl Tucker. Sai says that her condition is caused by poison. The servant is shocked and questions if it happened at the tea party. Sai says that they should investigate who did this. He says if he does not do his job as a doctor, he roughly has a grasp on her condition, so he will begin the treatment. He thinks that the poison is affecting her ability to recover magic. If he removes it and returns her back to her normal state, it should do the trick. He uses his detox spell to remove the poison from her body, and then a pure spell is used to help her recover. Then to restore her ability to recover magic, he uses the regeneration magic. Sai is doing a lot of work and is getting weak because restoring requires a huge amount of magic. He gets dizzy. The servant notices this and goes to bring the chair. Just then, Roselia wakes up. Sai is happy that the treatment has ended. He asks them to let her rest for a few days in order for her magic and stamina to recover as much as possible. The servant thanks Sai for his work. He says that this will make the master and madam overjoyed. Valms is worried about Sai and asks her not to push himself. He is already tired from the examination at the clinic. As they go back, <laughs> she says that until they reach the mansion, he needs to regain his energy with her lap pillow. He thanks her for her care while thinking he has never heard of a poison that causes magic deficiency. A few days later at the common district, a guy is going to the pub after completing his work for the day when he notices someone lying on the ground. He runs towards the guy to check up on him. He is shocked to see the face of the person. On the other hand, Sai is training Pados where he asks him to tighten his waist and stretch his back muscles more. After going through Velm's and Soldric's strict education, Pados is improving. Even though he is looking from the sideline, he thinks Pado's growth is tremendous, but his stewardship needs improvement. Sai thinks that if Pado's had become an adventurer back then, he would just have vanished by the roadside. He is glad that he stopped him. He says to Pado's that rather than his speed, he should focus more on his stance. He says he won't get a stringer with such a sloppy stance. From now on, with a good stance, Pado's should build upon his basic strength every morning. Monongaluk's skill is Sword Emperor. But Sai doesn't think that he trained properly. If he is going to take on that guy, he is going to have to do some serious training. A sword emperor who doesn't train and a farmer who trains. 
He is looking forward to seeing who will be stronger in the end. He is thinking about Pados when Dawson comes shouting his name. Valms tries to explain that Sai is busy training and if it's not an urgent matter, she will send him flying. Dawson says that there is an urgent matter. Sai asks what is it. Dawson requests him to come quickly. He says that in the Connor district there are many people who have collapsed. Hearing this, they run towards the district to check on the people. He shows him the man from earlier who had passed out. Dawson says that he found him when he was passing through. He says, there are others too who have collapsed here. <gasps> Valms looks at the bluish black face of the man as if it has been covered with ink. She questions what it is. Sai realizes that it is blackface disease. Its official name is El Luid Levs Prosen. But because of the symptoms or the color of the face changes, the commonly known name is blackface disease. It is a contagious disease known since thousands of years ago. Valms quickly protects Sai from a disease as it is contagious and asks him to stand behind her. She questions if Dawson touched the patient infected with the blackface disease. Sai says if that's the case, there is a high possibility that Dawson has also contracted it. Dawson is shocked and questions if he has the disease too. Sai says that it takes five days for the blackface disease to show symptoms. After five days, the possibility of the symptoms showing is extremely high. Dawson questions if he can be cured worriedly. Valm says that the disease is dangerous as it makes people vanish at the rate of 8%. It was said that having that symptom in other words is equivalent to having vanished. After this, Dawson gets depressed thinking that he is going to leave the world soon. Blackface disease is a type of disease with a high transmission rate. Considering how dense this area is, the number of infected people could be more than hundreds. Sai wonders if the outbreak is really originating from the commoner district. He questions if this would be spread to a wider area. At this rate, if it spreads to the capital, the scale of the victims could be more than 10,000. He says that if they don't isolate the commoner district, it will be bad. Valm says that there are no food reserves here. If they close it up, there will definitely be people who will vanish because of hunger. Dawson starts to cry thinking that either it is a disease or hunger, and they will soon vanish. Sai asks them to not give up. He says this isolation is for the sake of everyone. The reason they are isolating is to prevent the blackface disease from spreading more. This is a way to suppress it. He asks Dawson to bring all the patients with blackface disease over here. Dawson questions what he is going to do with them. Sai explains that he is going to treat them. Hopeful, Dawson questions if the disease is curable. Sai assures that he will do his best. Dawson agrees to bring the people, saying that he will not lose until he collapses from the symptoms. Sai asks Valms to update the Advantage Guild about the current situation. He would like her to discuss the food issues as well. He is sure that the Guildmaster has a certain influence in the country. He orders Lich to help him as well. He asks one of them to go to Solderek and arrange a carriage. First, they will bring all the patients to the clinic. Then, he will do the examination. As ordered, all the patients are gathered in one place. Hey <laughs> ask for their name and register them in the forms. Danon is glad that there is an empty land around the clinic where the patients are being laid. Silas saying this is the first time, they don't have to worry about finding a place. He uses his magic detox to cure the people and asks people to come back again if the symptoms become severe. He didn't think he would face the blackface disease again. Back then, he had been treating people like this every day. Blackface disease has a special character where reinfection is easy because of the infection ability. For this reason, treatment could only relieve symptoms but not enough to produce antibiotics. Preventing the recurrence in this way is the biggest key to ending the disease. After treating several people, Valm suggests having a rest. As expected, treating such a disease is very tiring. He thinks that the fatigue accumulates after treating a large number of people on consecutive days but the people with the symptoms have it more painful. He is about to leave when the guild's head comes in. She asks him if he could lend her some of his time. With that, they decide to have the conversation over a cup of tea. The guildmaster says that she has finished closing up the slum and the commoner's district. She wonders if she should say that they have successfully isolated the blackface disease. She says as expected there were people who vanished from famine. Valm says they can't say there is nothing they could have done. It is an outcome of doing their best. The guild head says that she always thought that blackface disease was just a myth, but it truly exists. After receiving the report, the adventurer's guilt started to move immediately. 
However, they couldn't stop the spreading of the blackface disease. Before they knew it, it had spread to the capital, and amongst the chaos, many aristocrats escaped from the capital. As a result, the blackface disease has widely spread throughout the whole kingdom. Thereafter, the burden on the country was finally lightened. The guildmaster says that the national borders to other countries were closed. Thanks to that, the victims are only within the country. Throughout the country, various adventurers' guild branches are currently disseminating countermeasures against this disease. She wonders if it will quiet down soon. Valm says to pray that it is effective. It is time to move forward step by step. Sai says they can't let their guard down. The situation should get better slowly. <sighs> Valms is disappointed that the priests are so useless. Even though they were so proud of themselves. The priest's recovery magic is to completely remove the cursed disease. Yet, for some reason, the patients didn't gain immunity and the black face disease resurfaced after treatment. Their magic has a bad affinity with the black magic disease. It can't be helped. It is always the problem with the special types. The guild's head says regarding that issue, they have told the temple, but having said that, they only limit it to the aristocratic district after using the same type of recovery magic as Sai. She wonders if even with the priest's magic, the recovery is only temporary. It is just that in the aristocratic district, the current people who are infected are mostly the servants in the house. The masters are relying on priest's magic. The price of the priest's treatment is high. If it is used on the servants, it looks like it is quite a difficult situation. Once the blackface disease has settled down in this area, she is thinking about getting herself involved. A week later, Rosie gives the pass asking to return it by today. Even though the guildmaster has given her permission. Sai needs to be careful not to bring the blackface disease. He is about to leave after getting the pass when Soldirk stops him. He apologizes for not contacting him in a while. Sai apologizes for making Solderic go out of his way to prepare a carriage for him. As he goes to the aristocratic district, the servant at Rosalie's house tells him that the master and the madam have been speaking of Sai to their friends in the aristocratic district. He says that many people have been affected by the disease and asked Sai to treat them all. He requests him to save the country. The disease spread a lot and was ruining the country. But it was finally quietened down three months later. The blackface disease was said to be incurable for thousands of years. The rumors about how to deal with it had vanished long ago. So it indeed helped a lot when Sai found out how to treat the disease. Sai thinks that he knows because he experienced it in his previous life. Although he can't say that. He remembers someone asking him not to say ridiculous things like that he wants to go on a trip. There were still so many people suffering from the disease. They requested him in his past life when he was a sage to save them. That was so many years before the treatment was found. In the end, he could go and see the end of the world. The guild's head says she doesn't want to investigate the means of uneasiness, but it would be better not to be too close to the temple for the time being. He questions about the temple to which she says that he has provided information about the treatment of the disease. For them, he is someone who is challenging the temple's authority. She says that could be a reason to arrest him. Sai says that he just wants to cooperate and help them. It looks like it will not get well. The guild head says that regarding the investigation process of the cause of the disease, as expected the possibility that it was schemed by some other country is low. That's because there isn't a super effective medicine. She doesn't think that there is a country that would risk having the blackface disease in their frontiers. Sai says that in that case, the humans were infected by a pathogen secretly left inside the animals. That's the plausible option. It was painful when he could not find any details at the beginning. For now, this is all they know. After that, Sai goes back to his villa where everyone greets him. Sai appreciates Pados for taking great care of the fields while he was gone. He is talking to everyone when Valms questions if he would like to have a dinner or bath. He laughs saying he is not sure, but he will have dinner first. Valms gets angry and says he is supposed to say he will have her. Sai looks at her nervously asking her not to glare at him like that. With that, they have dinner while Medius asks the orphan children if they know how to use the cutlery as he taught them. While eating, Sai asks Pados about the growth of medicinal herbs. Pados says that they are growing well. Sai says that it is time to stock up on rokai and asks for help in harvesting them. Pados agrees to do so making Sai think that he has completely become obedient. The education Valms and Solderic give to correct him is effective. Although it might have been a little too effective. 
He thinks that with children like Pados, Medes, and Barombo, this mansion has livened up. After dinner, Sai packs up the soaps when Solderic comes inside, stating he has brought the documents related to the soap sales. He looks at the packed soaps and questions if these are the stocks of soap they are planning to sell. Sai agrees saying that with the contiguous intense pressure of the ladies, it has come to this. He could only accept his fate and sell them properly. He is thankful for the children helping him, it looks like they could mass produce them without any problem. He thinks maybe he should buy out of empty land from Sandal to make a soap workshop. The workroom in the mansion is quite cramped. Thanks to Pados, the Rokai field is stable, it might be good to expand it further. Solderic says it looks like it will become a huge plan. Sai says the stability of the soap production might be good. As they take the soap, Velm says she can see the Vale's shop. As they all come close, Sai sees the shop only to realize that people are queuing. The shop shouldn't be opened yet though. Pados is shocked to see too many people as well. Valms asks him to be polite and watch his language. He usually uses informal language, which could probably be rude. Sai decides to go to the side gate. Although the soap originated from the wishes of the ladies, after the black face disease incident and to prepare for a hygienic environment, soaps were distributed to the patients. As a result, the rumor about the soap has spread through the nobles in the aristocrats' district. Because the clinic could no longer support the sales, they are now sold at Vale's shop. As they enter the shop from the side gate, they encounter Vale's daughter Rose washing clothes. Because Rose has the same green hair as Sai does, he seems to be a bit closer to her. He is thinking this when Valms reads his mind and quickly jumps in to mark her borders. Sai assures her that he is devoted to her. Just then, Vale's wife, Lucia comes out. Sai tells her that he brought soap. Lucia smiles at the soap, saying that Sai's soap popularity hasn't declined. Rose says that apparently, it is so popular that if she brings it to the public bath, it will be stolen. Pados is shocked to hear this and asks if it is true. <laughs> Osha agrees saying there are so many reservations flooding in. It will be helpful if he brings in large quantities for the time being. Sai understands and says he thinks that the production will be able to make it. Pados is taking good care of the medicinal herbs. The other ingredients are used to produce soap and can replenish the stock in Vale's shop. The children at the mansion are willing to help out so the sales are going well. They are off to a good start. As they go back to their mansion after delivering the soap, Barombo thanks Sai stating she is grateful. He questions why she is saying this all of a sudden. She says that the children are having fun working every day. The children who like to tinker with the soil are in the medicinal herb field. The children who are good with their hands are making the soap. She wonders if these children will be working as farmers or soap craftsmen in the future. She is sure that they won't live without starving. She thanks him for giving them the current environment. Sai says he also wants to thank them all. He is relieved that another worry has been resolved. This is a step towards his dream. He wonders maybe this time it will work, a travel to the end of the world.